Okay, so as an outline then, what I want to do is say in the simplest terms that I can what functional annotation actually is. Um, I've already been um, bested by Matthew Kent, uh, who's the king of analogies and, and did a very good job with this uh, on Wednesday. Um, then just to overview what the actual data is that we've produced. Um, and then importantly, what, what are its applications? I want to introduce, introduce that. So in a, in a very um, short way, We've worked on these six species. We've generated vast amount of, of new data. This has um, taken us a long time. It's cost a lot of um, taxpayers money, and there's been a huge numbers of groups and individuals involved in delivering. So it's quite a reasonable thing to ask at this stage. What has this um, project done to advance things? So not just in the terms of the scientific field. I think the talks we've had so far have shown how we've advanced the science, but now we need to start thinking how this uh, data can be used in practice in industry. And that's the, the, the point of today. So I'm going to start by trying to introduce genome functional annotation. Again, apologies to those who have seen um, many slides like this. But the, the basics then, uh, we need to define the genome, the genome being all of the, the DNA that's present in the nucleus of each cell. And as has been very clearly emphasized in this meeting already, this is the same genetic code in every cell. And with functional annotation, what we're interested in is understanding how that DNA is being used, which is dictating actually the traits that an organism will express, both at the molecular level and, and then in terms of the higher traits we're actually interested in in aquaculture. And that all starts with the, the nucleus, this compartment within the cell, the DNA, um, is the, the green strands within the cell. We can hone in on the, the DNA code as close as we want down to the individual letters. Of course, there's four letters in the DNA code. Um, and to emphasize then just the, the, the sheer size of the, the genome. So a turbot is a, a species that has a relatively small genome, but it still has around 500 million um, separate DNA bases. Uh, a salmon has more like 3,000 million DNA basis, so a vast amount of information. Uh, and it's then down to how that uh, nucleus is actually used in different situations that defines traits. Um, in the simplest example that Matthew also gave, um, the different cell types in the, the body of a fish or any organism, um, they, they involve the differentiation from some sort of earlier cell type like a stem cell, and that's all down to how this same DNA is being used or uh, very relevant to the discussion we had yesterday, for the same cell type, like an immune cell type, the, um, the genome is remodeled, it's being used in a different way when the same cell types have to change in response to an environmental challenge, like an infection, uh, where an immune cell might change its phenotype uh, to be involved in an immune response, like clearing the pathogen. That, that's all down to how the DNA is being used, and that's what functional annotation's all about. So in a nutshell, we're trying to assign um, functional activity to the, this vast amount of DNA sequence. We know um, in, in brief that most of the DNA doesn't do anything. Um, as a, a sort of foundation uh, for these different aquifang species and, and many aquaculture species these days, we have a, a reference genome sequence for the species, which is the, the backbone of DNA that we're trying to annotate with this information. And the, the first thing that we have to ask is uh, which genes are present in the genome and where are they found? Um, genes are the uh, absolute important part that code for the, the molecules that actually perform functions in cells, uh, mainly proteins. So if we go to our turbot example, in the half billion DNA base pairs in turbot, there's about 20,000 genes, similar number in, in CBAS. Um, and just to emphasize, this is a tiny fraction of the overall genome that has the, the genes, something like 1% 1, 1 might have protein coding genes. And uh, it's the sequence of the, the genes that matters and um, where the genome shows activity, ultimately that dictates which molecules, um, mainly proteins, um, which will perform the, the traits, sorry, perform the functions that lead to traits in cells. So the genes present in the genome are really important because they dictate the ultimate set of different proteins or molecules that a species can express, and variation in the code within individuals in the species then thus affects traits. So that's the simple first step 
Um, but then the next step is if we know the genes in the genome, um, how are they being used in, um, under different conditions that might be very relevant to different traits in aquaculture? And this is where the, the methods we're using start to come in. Um, and a very, very established method in defining how the genome is being used is RNA sequencing. This first step, how is the DNA being turned into the molecule which will eventually be uh, expressed as a protein? And we can use this method, RNA-seq, to look at differences between, for example, different tissues, which genes are expressed, which are differently expressed between different tissues. Um, and we can also then look at uh, which genes become expressed differently under different conditions, like during an infection. This is a powerful method where we can capture up to tens of thousands of genes uh, and their activity in a data set. Then the, the next level of annotation that we're interested in, which is the most novel one for Aquafang, is more about the epigenetic state of the DNA, which is uh, influenced um, by, not only by the DNA's chemical state itself, but by the molecules that the DNA interacts with inside the nucleus. So if we come back to our nucleus, um, the DNA can either be in a, a more closed or open state, depending on how wrapped it is around these molecules called histones, these um, wee turquoise barrels. When the DNA is um, less tightly wound or more open, it becomes accessible, and that means, in a nutshell, there can be more genome activity, including gene expression around those parts of the genome. So this is a very important um, part of the annotation. We use this method called a taxic without defining what that means. It, it quantifies how open the, the DNA is and how much activity is coming from different parts of the genome. Um, and again, we generate vast amounts of information in each data set that we produce about genome activity. Uh, then the final thing that we're interested in in Aquafang relates to these uh, molecules, the histones, these blue barrels, which can show a vast array of different chem uh, chemical modifications. We had a talk yesterday um, which went into a lot of detail around this, but these uh, modifications ultimately influence the DNA's um, epigenetic state and they influence how much activity that can occur in the, in the DNA around surrounding. And this can be both uh, positive, sorry, negative repressive effects and positive effects that leads to greater activity. Uh, in Aquafang, we use this um, method called ChIP-seq, which, among, among other things, can directly quantify the histone modification state of different parts of the, the DNA in the, the genome. And again, we capture vast amounts of data here. And then if we use these new types of data, the ATAC-seq uh, and the CHIP-seq, and we combine them, we can then identify uh, features in the genome that are of interest and were previously inaccessible um, to us prior to Aquafang. Um, so for example, elements that regulate gene expression, like the promoter region, which is a piece of DNA that sits just in front of a gene and is required for it to be expressed, or uh, enhancers, we've uh, ha heard a lot about enhancers, and very important regulatory regions that affect how genes are expressed under different conditions. So in any tissue will have its own sort of um, set of uh, specific promoters and enhancers. And likewise, within a tissue or a cell type even, there will be um, a range of promoters and enhancers that are active or repressed under different conditions that we might be interested in, such as um, an, an infection. And we've heard, heard a lot about that in the last two days. So, so with that introduction, what has Aquafang produced? Um, so we've used these different uh, methods that I've mentioned, RNA-seq, ATAC-seq, and CHIP-seq across the six species. We've generated hundreds of novel um, data sets, and we've done this in a bunch of different samples that are relevant to traits that might be interesting in aquaculture. This gives us these genome-wide maps, the functional activity in this uh, vast DNA sequence. So we've studied uh, different stages of um, embryos or embryonic development, dev maps. We've studied different tissues in both sexes at two stages of sexual maturation, so in immature and mature fish, uh, and in immune cells after immunological stimulation, and we, we've heard a lot in the last two days about all this data. Um, and this represents a major fundamental advance in basic understanding of how fish traits are coded within the DNA sequence. Um, all the data can be accessed, 
Um, just to very quickly say that Peter's speaking next, and he's going to give a tour of the Ensemble Genome Browser, where all the data that's been produced in Aquafang is shared, um, or in the process of being shared, in a very usable format that can be exploited, including by uh, industry. And Peter will give us a tour of some of the tools within Ensemble which uh, make that job easier. So coming on to the, the sort of novel applications of the data to sort of frame the coming talks and discussions. Oh, yeah. um, the main um, area for application that we see immediately is in selective breeding. Um, don't need to convince this audience, but obviously genetics is widely used to breed fish that have superior traits, things like faster growth, uh, more disease resistant animals. The, um, what we, we, of course, know is that within any, any species, any fish species, there are millions of genetic variants, but only a very tiny fraction of those genetic variants are actually influencing um, target traits for aquaculture breeding. So the, the data we've produced in Aquafang um, connects better the genetic variation or the genotype with the, the phenotype or trait variation uh, within our aquaculture breeding populations. By helping us identify genetic variants that overlap or might and hence might impact the very small fraction of the genome that has biological activity in um, samples of interest to particular traits that we're studying. And I think it's fair to say that largely speaking, the current approaches that are used in breeding do not distinguish variants on the basis of their potential function. Um, and until now, until we have this sort of aquafang data and other related types of data, achieving this was um, difficult or impossible for most parts of the, the genome. So this is just one um, quick example. This is actually a figure that's been taken from uh, a white paper that's coming from the project that Ian Johnston is leading on. This is a very small region in the Atlantic salmon genome, about 40,000 base pairs, which um, is already associated with um, pigmentation, with flesh color. Um, and in this region, there are two genes of interest, um, which uh, are likely the thought to be uh, causally affecting pigmentation. Um, what we're looking at here is the ensemble prediction of uh, regulatory elements that have been made from the uh, attack-seek and chip-seek data sets in salmon from the body map specifically. Um, so the genes are shown up here in the red or the dark red, and you can see the different uh, regions of interest, the promoter regions in the red here. Uh, the enhancer regions in yellow, and the, the parts of the DNA that are open but haven't been assigned to be promoters or enhancers. So just in this small part of the genome, you can see the, gen the genetic variants that exist. Um, there's maybe 150 genetic variants, but you can see a very small proportion of these variants, um, 10, 5 to 10% maybe, actually overlap with these regulatory elements, which then become more interesting because they're more likely to Im impact the expression of the genes and hence influence the trait. And you can scale this data up across the entire genome, the millions of variants, um, and then it becomes very um, useful as a tool. So this um, figure's been presented a couple of times at this meeting already, but since I made it, I thought I would also present it. Um, this is, in a nutshell, what we've done in Aquafang. Um, we've fed in all these different sample types representing different biological variation to identify a very large number of new elements in these farmed fish genomes, shared the data to maximize impact. Um, the tools available to overlap our, our findings with um, genetic variation to prioritize variation that's more plausibly um, actually causative of the variation, still a lot more work to do to actually prove causation. Um, and then the sort of applications that follow is really what we're here to discuss today. So new, new um, genetic tools, new breeding models that take into account functional genetic variation, and looking to the, the future um, genome editing that actually relies on having a very precise understanding of um, genome activity beyond just where the genes are, but also where the, the regulatory regions are. And that's, the, that's what Aquafang really opens up. 
Um, so I'm going to wrap up and just say that after lunch, we'll be having a panel discussion. This is going to be chaired by Ashi from uh, Maui. And this is meant to be an industry to academic dialogue concerning the uptake of the results in the project, both in the short term and looking to the, the long term. So we just ask people in the audience and online to reflect on the, the talks today um, and bring along questions and comments and all perspectives will of course be very welcome. That's it. Thanks a lot, Dan. That was very informative. <laughs> <laughs>